We're going to finish up chapter 19 today. It's called the, Crucifi the Crucifixion. Now, chapter 19 ends with Jesus being put in the tomb. And chapter 20 begins with him coming back to life. So next week, what I plan to do is a sermon called Between Death and Life. What happened between death and life? What happened between the time Jesus was put in the tomb and he walked out of the tomb? I believe that's as important as what took place between the times that Mary saw Jesus in the garden. He said, don't touch me. And then later the disciples saw him and he said, touch me. I think what happened between those two times, they're, e they're equally important. So this kind of give you a heads up what's coming for next week. We're going to start off in 19, and uh, 16b, okay, say a word of prayer before we start. Father, as we open up your word this morning, Father, let it be real to us. Father, not my words, but yours. Yeah. Everything we say, let it bring honor to you. I just praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Now, verse 16 begins uh, where we left off last time. So they delivered him over, delivered him over to them to be to be crucified. Now, when this was written in the original text, they didn't have uh, chapter verse. Okay, when they came along and did chapter verse, sometimes they didn't get the verses exactly where they needed to. 16 should have ended with crucified, and 17 should begin with so. But it didn't. So we're going to take up the last part of 16. And so it says, So they took Jesus. And he went out, buried his own cross to a place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Now, here in John, it's a brief one sentence description. He carried his own cross. And he went to Golgotha, to Golgotha. You read John, it's one sentence, boom, there and done. When you read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get a bigger picture of this. The so-called Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows. We got to walk part of that when we were there. And Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, we see Simon of Cyrene being called out to carry the cross. And in Luke, the women are crying, and Jesus talks to them. And if you go to the stations of the cross, you see Jesus falling three times. That is not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The Catholics have writings where that is in there. Could that have ha happened? Yeah, it could have. Very possible. Okay? Because Jesus was weak from everything he'd gone through. Everything. That's why they pulled Simon from Cyrene out of the crowd to finish carrying the cross. Okay? So, Jesus goes to Golgotha. To Golgotha. John says he carried his cross. John wants us to focus on Jesus on his way to the cross. He wants us to look at the shepherd king laying down his life for his sheep. The king was carrying his own cross to crucifixion and to his glorification. The way we see the cross isn't how it really was. Okay, They usually just carried the cross piece. I mean, it was a huge piece of timber. It was very heavy. They didn't carry the entire cross. The the upright piece was was, sta was stationary. It was in the ground. It was sturdy. It was secure. And they'd take the cross piece and nail their hands to it, usually pulling their arms so they're just the most dislocated. And they would drive the nails, not in their hands as we see it, but in their wrist. Because they considered the hand to be from here down. If you put, a, if put those big spikes in your hands, it's going to pull it on through. But to get the bones of the wrist, it's going to hold. So they would get their, hand, their hands, their wrists, nailed to this cross piece and then raise it up and drop it on the upright piece. Felt really good, right? 
And then they would bring their feet down and either nail them one on top of the other or one on each side of the cross. And by doing this, when they hung on the cross, it threw their chest out in front of them and made it almost impossible to breathe. They need to push up on those nails of their feet to get a gasp of air. It was labor intensive to breathe in and then hang and breathe out. And Romans did not invent crucifix crucifixion, but they perfected it. They were great at it. And so here's Jesus, here's Jesus going to the cross, carrying the cross piece. He is the sacrifice. We see this, and my, my mind, it brings back the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham made covenant with God, and I'll get into that at a later date, but he made covenant with God, and the last stage of the covenant was you would exchange your firstborn son. God and Abraham, Abram at the time, became Abraham after this, made covenant, and so God required his firstborn. And he said, go to Mount Zion and crucify and, and, and do sacrifice for me there. Bring your son and sacrifice him to me. I require your son. Abraham knew this when he went into a covenant that had exchanged firstborn. If you remember, the servants and Isaac, Abraham went, they get to the base of the mountain, and he puts the wood on Isaac and he tells the servants, you wait here. The boy and I will go up to the mountain and worship and we will come back to you. Why did he say that? Because he knew all the promises God had made went through Isaac. So he knew if I sacrifice my son, God's going to raise him from the dead. They go to the mountain. They build the altar and Isaac says, Father, where is the sacrifice? Isaac, lay down. Remember the story is Abraham bringing the knife down to kill his own son. God stopped his hand and says, Abraham, look in the thicket. And there was a ram. God knew Abraham had fulfilled his end of the covenant. Fast forward. God's firstborn, his only son, right? Only begotten son is now being sacrificed for all of mankind. God's fulfilling his end. Abraham did. Now God does. God's son is delivered up and he's sacrificed for you and me. Verse 18. There they crucified him with two robbers or thieves, is what your translation says. With him two others, one on either side of him, and Jesus between them. Okay? Now these two thieves, one on each side, all the Gospels mention this. Only Luke goes into detail where one thief mocks Christ, hanging on the cross. If you're so great, get us down from here, yada, yada, yada. The other one gets on to him and says, can't you see this is a righteous man? And then he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into paradise. He said, today you'll be with me. The thief has forgiveness on the cross and was forgiven. Okay? 19 through 22. <clears throat> Potter also wrote that inscription, an inscription put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. <coughs> Many of the Jews read this, inscript, this, inscript, this inscription for the place where Jesus was cru crucified was near the city, city. It was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Remember, he'd been going back and forth with these guys. He didn't write this, I don't believe, just to spite them. I believe he wrote this one because he believed it. Two, to spite them. He wrote it in three languages. 
Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Why three? And why these? Well, this is a public execution. Very busy road. People come by or see this. Romans love to do this because they're like, you know what? You break the law, this is you. That way to deter crime, right? Everybody who passed by would see this. This was, as I said, the Roman way of keeping the law. It was written in Hebrew or Aramaic, the language of the general populace. It was written in Latin, which is the language of the army and the presiding government. And in Greek, the universal language of commerce in that time. Anybody passing by, there was a language they could read. There was a language they could read. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The King of the Jews. Verses 23 through 25. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, had crucified Jesus they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier. Also his tunic. But the tunic was seam was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bot to from top to bot bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill script, scripture which said, They divided my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. John, he is a master at picturing contrast. Okay? And none is more evident than right here. Soldiers and friends who loved Jesus. On one side you have the conquering soldiers dividing the spoils, totally unconcerned about the dying man. They didn't care. On the other side you have people who loved him watching as their hearts were breaking. The soldiers divided his outer garment in four, four parts, and the undergarment, which was woven in one piece, they said, hey, let's not tear this. Let's cast lots. When we were there, we got to see, still etched in stone, most likely the game they were playing when they cast lots for this. And nobody knows how to play the game. It's interesting. They had strange little dice that they used, and they cast lots. This undergarment was worth some money. They could take these things and sell them. Psalm 22, 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. John records the four women standing at the foot of the cross. His own mother, mom, can you imagine your son? Her heart was broken. Her own son, she knew what promises had been given to her from God, and yet here is her son hanging on the cross. It had to seem like, God, you really messed up this time. Her sister's there with her. Mary, the wife of Clopas, who don't really know anything about her. And then Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus had delivered all the demons out of. They're there at the foot of the cross. John didn't mention it, but he's there too. Okay? John is there as well. These four women are there looking up, and they're crying. I can just imagine them just weeping. And the Roman soldiers are laughing and having a good time. They don't care. They didn't want to be in this region of the world anyway. If we could make some more Jews suffer and die, <laughs> funny games. Funny games. What a stark contrast. Verses 26 through 28. When Jesus saw his mother, the disciple whom he loved, remember that's John speaking about himself. <clears throat> you, you just got to love John, right? 
saw his mother, and the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? That's like me telling my nephews and nieces, come see your favorite uncle. I'm not their only one. I'm still their favorite. <laughs> when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her to his own home. <clears throat> now these verses have always seemed a bit strange to me. Why? Because Mary has other kids. Jesus is not an only child. Chapter 7 talks about the brothers of Jesus and they didn't really believe he was who he was. Matthew chapter 12 is when his mother and brothers want to see him and, and somebody comes and says, hey, your mothers and your, your, your mom and your brothers are outside. They want to talk to you. He said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He's referring to the church as the whole church are his brother. Okay? So we know Mary had other kids. So why did Jesus tell John, take care of my mama? Why did John take her into his home? Same odd to you? The traditional role of the oldest son in the Jewish family was to provide for the care of his mother when the husband or the father of the house was no longer around. Joseph was already dead. So Jesus fulfilled his family responsibility as a dutiful son by saying, John, here's your mother. Mother, here's your son. He passed that mantle on to someone else to take care of his mother. Remember what I said earlier about John? Remember when he got to the courtyard because his family was known they were well off? Okay? So Jesus asked John to take care of his mother. From that hour on, the disciple took her into his own home. 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, quotation marks, to fulfill scripture, I thirst. And he probably had anything to drink. Since he and his disciples finished celebrating Passover and went to the garden. That night he was arrested, he was tried, he was put in the, in the pit, pulled out the next morning, taken to Pilate. He had nothing to drink for 24 hours, maybe. I don't know for sure how long. For a long time. And so he says two words to fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they took a sponge, put, they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, gave up his spirit. This is the end of Jesus' earthly life. These verses seem pretty straightforward. Jesus was thirsty, gave him something wet, and he died. All right? John uses a word here three times in three different verses that means that the life of Jesus was coming to its intended end or goal. This wasn't an untimely death. It wasn't a surprise nor a result of those who hated him finally winning. It was his intended goal. It's why he came to earth. Jesus has succeeded. He didn't lose. Jesus won. He has succeeded. The intended hour of Jesus' glorification has finally, fully arrived. 
The king had been crucified and he was dying. He had been beaten, mocked, burdened with heavy cross piece, nailed to it, hoisted up on a pole, dropped onto the upper piece. His body craved something to drink, so he cried, I am thirsty. Psalm 69, 21, they gave me poison for food and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. They used a, hiss, a, a hyssop branch to give him a bit of moisture. Remember what the hyssop branch was? When the angel of death was going over their homes in Egypt and they put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost so the death angel would pass over, it's what became Passover. They used a hyssop branch to put that blood on. I love how God's word is all connected. <clears throat> they used a hyssop branch. He said, it is finished. Bowed his head, gave up his spirit. He died. It is finished. Three words that have reverberated through Christian history. It is complete. It is finished. Christian, his, Christian history, Christian theology, it is an expression that has just reverberated through. It speaks of the finished work of Christ. Jesus is portrayed as totally in control of the time of his dying. For John, the point of the story is not just that Jesus was killed, but that he died in accordance with God's appointed hour. Remember, Jesus at any point could have said, that's enough. Father, send your angels. He was sent legions of angels to take Jesus off the cross and destroy the world. But Jesus didn't because he did this for us. He was in total control of his death. Think about that. Total control. Verses 31 through 37. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. And they came to Jesus and they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Very important. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you may also believe. That's John speaking. I've seen it, and it's true. For these things took place, the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be bro broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Why was the Sabbath a high day? Okay, Sabbath for the Jews is from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Why was this Sabbath a high day? It's because that Sabbath fell on Passover. Passover is in the same day of the week every year, right? It goes on Nisan on the 15th, Jewish calendar, the month of Nisan, N I S. Amen. And so the day of prep was Nisan the 14th. The 15th was on Sabbath, day of Passover, and Sabbath. So it's a high Sabbath. That's what that means. It was a very important one because it wasn't just Sabbath, it was also Passover. It was very important. Another thing that Jesus fulfilled. The Romans usually left people hanging on the cross until they were sure they were dead. And they would leave them until the birds were pecking on their head and their face. 
Animals are eating on their feet. Gross? Yeah, just back. But they said, hey, you know, it's a high Sabbath. We don't want these bodies hanging because it will desecrate our Sabbath. And so Pilate says, okay, go break their legs. So they take this big wooden mountain long stick and they'd swing it and break their knees. Why? You can no longer push up on your legs to get a breath. And so you're just hanging there and you would just suffocate. They broke the legs of one thief, broke the legs of the other thief, came to Jesus and said, wait, he's already dead. So they tossed the mallet aside and get a, get a spear, get a jab, get a jab one. And they come and they stick it in his side up towards his heart. And the Bible says blood and water came out. Okay? What does it mean when blood and water? Well, let's back up to the broke to the broken legs. Why is that important? <coughs> the sacrificial lamb could not have spot nor blemish. If you had a sacrificial lamb and it fell and broke its leg, you couldn't use it because then it was blemished. It wasn't clean anymore. It had a broken leg. Right? That kind of goes back to a story of a lady. I, I actually knew her. She was an old lady when I was a kid. But she was kind of mean. And she had a chicken that was dying. You could tell it was flopping around about to die. She tells her husband, go out there quick, wring that chicken's neck and take it to the preach to the preach to the preacher. What was it dying of? They didn't know. She wanted to wring its neck and give it to the preacher to eat. She didn't want to eat it. Right? So sacrificial lamb had to be unblemished. Jesus is our sacrificial lamb, and he did not have a broken bone. It was still a pure sacrifice. So they took this jab, this uh, jab, this jab, javelin, and stuck it up in his side, up towards his heart. Why? To make sure he was dead. The word says that blood and water flowed out. What does that mean? Some medical theories have argued that instead of just the side being punctured, the upper pericardial sac was pierced which resulted in a separated blood and water flowing out. Others have suggested that the separated mixture filled the lungs and the rib cage, and then the lower membrane containing the separated mixture was punched, was punctured. We don't know for sure, all right? We do know when they pierced his side, blood and water came out. 1 John 5, 6 through 8. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Water and blood flow down. Verses 38 through 42. After these things, Joseph of, Arith of Arith Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took, him, took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and buried it in, a, in, in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where, they, where he was crucified, there was a garden, and the garden was a new tomb in which no one had, been, had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Remember when they came, the women came, and Jesus' body wasn't there, and they thought Jesus was the gardener. He says, tell us, sir, where you've taken him. 
and we'll go there. Why? Well, this wasn't Jesus' tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. And so it made sense that, okay, we'll get the stone out of the way, we'll take the body and move him to where he is supposed to be, to his family's tomb. Now, <clears throat> the way these tombs were built, they had a slab inside. They would take the body, they would clean it, put it in a shroud, put the spices on top of the body, and the body would decay. The spices would help control the odors, right? They would seal the tomb up, and then the body would decompose. They'd come back sometime later and take the bones and put them in a box, okay? We got to see a lot of those boxes while we were there. They would etch in what family it was and who it was on that box. And then they'd put that box somewhere in that tomb and it slapped to be used again. Okay? Not the way we do things. That's okay. It's the way they do. So they took Jesus, about 75 pounds of spice of spices. And this is enough spices to bury a king royally. <coughs> Remember the ladies came early on Sunday morning bringing spices? They didn't bring 75 pounds. They just brought bags. They used 75 pounds for Jesus. When you would bury a king and bury him royally, that's what you would use. Coincidence? No. Just like they use myrrh and aloe, why myrrh? Do you remember myrrh? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh? The wise men came bringing those three. And yet myrrh was not a gift for a living king, but for a dead one. They used myrrh in burials. And now here Jesus is being buried with myrrh. Okay? Jesus is appropriately being buried as a king. Joseph of Arimathea came and took the body down. Nicodemus came and helped him. We remember him, right? He knew Jesus by night. These both, both these guys were like, they're still important people, they're both still rich. And Joseph of Arimathea was in the Sanhedrin, very important. But they didn't let their other people know they were following Jesus. Now they came and said, you know what? We don't care. We're taking his body down. Our Lord, our Savior, was hung on a cross. He was crucified in the most painful way. He did all of this for us. Why? So we can be forgiven of our sin. Romans 10, 8 through 11, 11 says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Our invitation this morning. I want to ask you if you've made that decision for Christ. Christ made the decision for you. Christ made that decision for you. He not only left heaven and came to earth in a human form, he went willingly to the beads, to the whippings, to the torture, to the cross, to the tomb. For us. For us. He made that choice for us. We should make that choice for Him. Every day of our life. Not just Sundays. Right? Every day in our workplace, in our school. We need to make that choice for Jesus. Invitation this morning, I pray that you will get serious with God. Do what needs to be done between you and Him. 
Maybe you've been saved for a long time and just not right where you need to be with him. Right now, today is the day to make that right. Okay? Let's pray, Father. We come to you. We thank you. And we praise you. Father, may anyone who is here whose life is not what you want it to be, realize that today and get right with you. Whether they just need to be more serious about their walk with you, about reading your word, about prayer, about sharing their faith, whatever it might be. May this be the day they get serious <coughs> about their relationship with you. Father, I just thank you. I praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Let's all stand as we sing. <coughs>